Please pray with me. Let us pray. Loving God, we ask that you would be with us in this time of um, reflecting on your holy scripture. Help us to hear the word that you have for each of us and for all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, because I'm a huge NPR listening nerd, I know that in the last week, the value of the rial, which is the Iranian currency, dropped by 30% in a week, this last week. Did anyone else know that? Does anyone else pay attention to these things? All right. Okay. It's just me. So, um... What happened was this. Uh, for a long time, the real has been dropping in value very slowly, uh, like a few percent a month. Uh, but then, uh, maybe for a year and a half, because of different outside pressures on the, uh, the sanctions that they're dealing with. Um, but then this last week, the government decided to stop uh, making dollars available to people who wanted to trade their reals for dollars, um, stop making dollars available to regular people. And so um, there were a lot of people who wanted to get rid of their reals and get dollars, and there were a lot fewer people who had dollars who they wanted to trade. And so the more people traded, the more they wanted to trade their reals, and there was lots and lots of people who wanted to get rid of them, and fewer and fewer people wanted to trade for them. And basically, um, the currency collapsed because people stopped believing that it was worth what it had been worth before. The money was only worth what we believed it was worth. And the U.S. dollars work in a similar way, to be honest. They rely on a certain amount of um, belief on our part. So if I have a $20 bill in my pocket, what I really have isn't 20 of something. It's a piece of paper that has pictures and numbers and maybe a plastic or a magnetic strip on it. Uh, and it's not really worth $20, except that it is worth $20 because of a promise. It's kind of like there's a promise that we all make to each other in the United States that if I give you my $20 bill, you will give me $20 worth of something that I want in exchange for it, um, like a haircut or chocolate chip cookies. So it's not surprising that, given that money is uh, in some ways based on a promise, that money starts to make other bigger promises to us. That we start hearing promises from money like, I can make you happy, or I can keep you safe, or I can win you respect or love. And then to think of that, it is... It might not be so surprising that we have this young man in the story that we read from the gospel who, even when Jesus in person invites him to follow him, has to say no because he's listening to the promises that money makes instead of the ones that Jesus is making to him. I think of this guy, I think he might be uh, maybe a type A personality a little bit. Um, he comes to Jesus and he's hoping to sort of get like the top 10 ways to inherit eternal life, right? Uh, just like a list, or maybe um, maybe like a tweak or two, like here's how you need to change your prayer style, um, or here's the, here's the technique that you're missing out on. I think he's hoping for tweaks, right? Not a major um, overhaul, renovation. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, what is, the, what is the good deed that I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus already is not playing this game. He says, why do you ask me what's good? Only one thing is good. Only one person is good. Hint, it's God. Right? So Jesus says, you know, and, and I, it seems sort of abrupt, but I think he's trying to um, wake this man up and say, the questions you're asking is a lot bigger than you think it is. And Jesus says, well, and then he kind of gives, I guess this could be considered a boring answer, right? He says, well, you've read the Bible, do the commandments. Do you remember what they are, right? You know, sort of like a quiz. Here's the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't murder. Honor your mother and father. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, now, you might not notice when Jesus is listing that list, um, he actually leaves out a commandment, which is do not covet, which is interesting when you think about this young man. But anyway, so Jesus says, well, do the commandments. 
And the young man says, well, I did them all, which is impressive. I'm impressed. Um, personally, I'm like, good job, you know. Uh, so he does all the commandments, and Jesus says, all right, if you want to be perfect, then you need to sell everything you own and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And the story ends that the young man goes away grieving because he has many possessions, which is a fascinating thing to say, that because he has a lot of stuff, he can't get rid of it. Like you might think, oh, if you have only a little bit of stuff that you would want to hold on to it even more, but somehow it works the opposite way, that because he has a lot of stuff, he's not able to let go of it and to walk away and to follow Jesus. So I want to tell a story about someone who was able to say yes to Jesus, or maybe his story of his sense of call into a new life. Um, His name is Francis, and he um, grew up he grew up, he had pretty good at growing up. He, um, his dad was a rich businessman, and his mom was from France, so that's pretty much like ideal. And, no, all right, nobody wants to have a French mom besides me. Okay, and, um, you know, she, I, whatever. Anyway, thank you, Priscilla. Um, and so he, uh, and he lives it up, right? He goes to parties. He's like the popular kid. People are always like, what's Francis up to? You know? Um, and as he got older into his teens, he started getting interested in the military. Um, and in those days, if you wanted to be in the military, you had to buy all your own stuff. You had to have your own horse, um, armor, weapons, everything. And Francis is able to afford it because his dad's rich. And so he goes off to war to defend his his people. Um, But while he's in battle, um, he's captured, and he's in prison for a year. Um, And while he's in prison, he's sick. And so he leaves that experience a different person, and he becomes much less frivolous and much more serious. Um, And he starts to think about life in a whole different way, and about God in a whole different way. Um, And so that's kind of the beginning of his transformation. And then one day, he's still a soldier. He is um, riding down the road, and he sees a man who has leprosy. And he gets off of his... At first, he's, like, disgusted. He's grossed out. Um, But then he gets up off of his horse, and he puts his robe around the man. And he um, kisses his face, which has sores on it, and gives him all of his money. And somehow, in that moment, he feels like he has seen the face of Christ in someone... with just nothing, someone with just nothing to their names. Um, And it's a very powerful moment for him. And he starts to wonder, how could I live a life that's different from the one that I'm living? Um, And a a year or two later, he's in a church, an old church, a few hours away from his um, home, and he's praying, and he has a vision of Jesus. And Jesus says, Francis, repair my church, which, as you can see, is in disrepair. So at first, Francis thinks he's talking about, well, at that time, Francis thinks he's talking about literally the church he's sitting in. And he looks around, he's like, yeah, it could probably use a new heating system. And so he got, not really, this is a long time ago before heating systems. Um, so he goes, but it does need some help, maybe a roofing job, right? And so he goes to, he goes home, and he takes a bunch of cloth out of his dad's store and sells it and brings the money to the priest. And the priest is like, well, I don't know where you got this money. I can't just take his money. So Francis gets frustrated, and he, like, throws all the gold. He just throws it, and it scatters. Um, and he goes off, and he lives in a cave for a month. Okay. I don't know. That's not really a highlight. I don't know why you need to know he lived in a cave. Anyway, his dad's really mad about this. All right, so his dad takes him to court. His dad says, you, everything you have is from me, and so you need to do what I say, and that includes not selling my stuff and giving it to some church in the middle of nowhere. And so Francis thinks about this, and he thinks about his year in jail, and he thinks about meeting the leper on the road, and he um, remembers seeing Christ's face in that man, and he remembers seeing Jesus in this church that he's in. And he stands up and he says, if depending on you means that I can't do what Jesus wants me to do, then I give it up. And he gave up his inheritance, and he gave up everything he owned. And then, in his most dramatic action, he took off all the clothes that he was wearing that his father had given to him, and he 
left the courthouse stark naked, as naked as the day he was born, to start a new life as a beggar and as a passionate follower of Jesus. So I wonder, when I think about these two young men, what made it possible for one to say yes to Jesus and one to say no, or made it so that the other one said no. And I think there is something in there about which promises we trust. Are we going to trust God's promises the way that Francis did? Or will we say that money or some other set of promises is going to be the one that guides us and that leads us as we go out? Francis went on, you may know him as St. Francis of Assisi, went on to found three different orders within the Catholic Church, monks, nuns, and lay people. He went on to become the patron saint of Italy and of the environment, basically, and of animals. Um, those, that's a different set of stories. But he, bec- he built a new way of life that take, takes poverty into account in a certain way that just hadn't been done before. And he answered that call that Jesus gave to him to repair the church, the whole church, which had been in disrepair. And the reason he was able to do that the reason he was able to live such a big life for God was because before anything else, he trusted God's promises. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have some time for silence, and then we'll reflect on the community conversation question together. How does trusting God relate to money? Um, And this one, we're actually going to talk in small groups for that one. But let's have some time for silence now to reflect.